Sightings of a bizarre flying monster have been terrifying the residents of New Jersey for centuries. My first reaction was, oh my God, it was very scary. I felt like I am frail. The beast is thought to live deep in this desolate forest. No one was going out after dark. The whole area was just in a state of emergency. The creature seems to have no fear of man. The creature gave out a blood-curdling scream and escaped out the chimney. And now, new evidence may help unmask this legendary creature. I don't know where the animal came from. Some people say the government testing facility. Monster Quest launches an unprecedented expedition in search of the Jersey Devil. You all set to go? Head start. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers. On Monster Quest. New Jersey, among the oldest states in the nation. It is rich in history and legend. It's also America's most densely populated state, home to nearly nine million people. But nestled within its borders lies an isolated region known as the Pine Barrens, over one million acres of forbidding forest. The area is home to deer, birds, and something else, a legendary monster known as the Jersey Devil. A body that's similar to a horse or a deer. It was just really ugly, and it was a snout, but it wasn't a snout of anything I've seen. The head of a horse, uh, the wings of a bat, the feet of a goat, and a long serpentine tail. It was like grotesque, very dark, round eyes. Eyewitness descriptions of the Jersey Devil vary. From a winged half-bird, half-horse, standing upright on hoof feet with a reptilian tail, to a hairy creature walking on all fours, resembling a cross between a monkey and a dog. The first written descriptions of the Jersey Devil date back to colonial times. In the early 1800s, Joseph Bonaparte, brother of Napoleon, reported seeing the creature while hunting in the Pine Barrens. In 1804, a posse was formed to capture the creature after a rash of livestock kills. But nothing was found, and the attacks continued. This story has, has been around for more than 250 years. Dr. Angus Gillespie is a professor of American studies at Rutgers University, specializing in the folklore and mythology of the United States. He has collected eyewitness accounts of the Jersey Devil for 35 years. There's been many sightings, many respectable citizens in South Jersey, police officers, sheriffs, uh, city councilmen, uh, ministers, priests, rabbis, have all reported seeing the Jersey Devil. In uh, nearly every case, it wasn't uh, one person telling the story. Uh, the story was corroborated by several witnesses. So. Um, that let, puts a lot of weight on uh, the truth of the story. To the old-time residents of South Jersey, the Jersey Devil is not a joke. It's not a cartoon character. Uh, this is a fearsome, awesome, dangerous creature. The Pine Barrens are triangulated by Philadelphia, 50 miles to the northwest, and New York City, 110 miles to the northeast. In just the last 20 years, there have been over 200 reported sightings of the creature, most clustered within this dense forest. And these terrifying encounters continue to this day. It just happened so quickly. It was horrible. Lori Winkleman lives with her husband, Glenn, and their three children near the Wharton State Park in the Pine Barrens. She describes a frightening nocturnal sighting that still haunts them. Mm. There is always this discernible eeriness out here. There's just something in the air. Well, that night had been a big storm, the first significant one. Lori and her children were outside enjoying a recent snowfall and were headed inside for supper. I realized that I had left Christmas lights on because it's kind of dark and creepy out here at night. Lori had her 11-year-old son, Glenn Jr., accompany her outside to turn off the light. 
I was standing at a utility pole that just had a big electric outlet, and I bent over and was trying to pull this plug out. Simultaneously, I looked at my son who was standing right in front of me, and his face was just terrified, and he was like making garbled noises, pointing up. Lori saw a giant black creature perched high in the tree above their heads. Their terror turned to panic when the beast swooped down. And just knew I had to get my son in the house. He was absolutely frozen. He just couldn't even move. I felt like prey. And I just charged forward. There was just this black, like, sensation of like a whoosh overhead of us, on top of us. And in a split second, I heard it on the roof. And all of a sudden, I knew this thing was exactly in the direction that we were running. And the second that we got to the doorstep, you could hear it coming down the roof, making these really click-clack, weird, metallic-y, bony noises. And we just got in the door, slammed the door, and then just started screaming and freaking out in the kitchen. The Winkleman family spent a sleepless night and awoke in the morning to discover that their attacker left a clue. The uh, next morning, I was awoken then to, with my husband saying, oh my gosh, you won't believe this, but I went out and there are footprints, tracks, exactly on the roof where you said. Um, he took pictures of the tracks and they were still pristine. It was early in the morning on that side of the snow. It was like so great. They were perfectly preserved. The snow was still deep. Lori Winkleman's husband, Glenn Sr., immediately showed the photograph to a friend and expert hunter to see if he could identify what the animal was. Brought it in, showed it to him, not a clue. I have no idea what it was. With their anxiety rising, the Winkelmans brought the photos to a local office of the New Jersey Division of Parks and Recreation. But regional wildlife experts could not identify the tracks. They were kind of frightened for us because the, the footprints were nine inches by five inches and four feet apart and two-legged, so he didn't know what it could be at all. I reluctantly called the police. They did a perimeter search. He saw the tracks on the roof. He said he would estimate the size to be about, like, I believe it was two to 400 pounds of whatever it was. Um, he said about the size of a large bear. Uh, he then asked me if I had guns, and where I'm from, people don't have guns in the house. And I said, no, and he just said, maybe you should get some. Monster Quest will conduct an independent investigation into the Winkleman's claim. I go into every investigation with an open mind. Mitch Parker is a retired detective from the New York City Police Department. He will use his 22 years of criminal investigation experience to establish what the Winkelmans actually saw. It's saying it's a devil. It, it, it looks like a gargoyle. It looks it's got big giant bat wings. But let's go into it with an open mind. We'll see what's there. Parker begins by visiting the local police station to review the report of the sighting. The report describes an unknown type of animal with prints six inches long and a four foot span between them. While some debate the existence of the Jersey Devil, there are others who are convinced that the tracks belong to a monster. It was about a month later when my team got to go out there and did a full-scale investigation. Laura Luter heads the Jersey Devil Hunters, a research group dedicated to collecting verifiable evidence of the creature's existence. She is impressed by the Winkleman's report. Even to this day, four years later, the story they tell me now is the same story that they were telling me when it actually took place. Luther's team has compiled a comprehensive database of historic and contemporary encounters. They have organized the sighting clusters by year, season, and time of day. We do try to get out there as well into the, you know, into the woods to try and see if there's any other evidence, any physical evidence that we could turn up. We're going to use historical data and trends to see if we can find the most likely place. Monster Quest will use this information to mount a search for the Jersey Devil at the epicenter of the sightings, Wharton State Forest in the Pine Barrens. There's places in the Pine Barrens that probably folks haven't walked for many, many years um, because the vegetation is dense, uh, lack of roads, um, just uh, no access to these areas. Led by hunter and professional tracker Dave Fans, 
A 60-man search party will explore one of the most remote areas of the forest. Fans, a native of New Jersey, grew up in the area and knows it well. There have been reports of black bears in the Pine Barrens, and for us to never see one of these bears that are in the areas where we hunt would seem to suggest to me that there could be other animals out in the Pine Barrens that we've never seen as well. The goal of this expedition is to capture an image of the Jersey Devil. To ensure success, fans will borrow ancient tactics and strategies used for hunting deer and buffalo. The Indians hunted like this hundreds of years ago, where we attempt to push the deer or drive the deer in the direction of where we put standers, hoping that they'll see the deer. Um, it's a very effective method of hunting. The process involves a main driving group, which will fan out over four miles across the northern edge of the area. They will push towards a smaller team positioned in the surrounding trees to spot creatures fleeing the push. Fans have set up a camp 10 miles from the search site to maintain the element of surprise. Okay, guys, we're going to have uh, Johnny's gang's going to be in bands three and four, minor in bands one and two. Crumble's gang is going to uh, uh, drive, and we're going to stand. And let's see what we can find. It is 6 a.m., and the team loads into five vans that will transport them to their starting positions. No, get in van number three or van number four. Seven cameramen are embedded in the two teams to document the action. Four with the driving team, and three at the end of the trail. Fans will control and monitor the search party's progress using VHF two-way radio transceivers. Hey, Crumble, uh, you all set to go? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and start. Hey, Ed, you good? We're all set. I got Larry set up, and I'm set up next to him. All right, we're going to start. The expedition is underway. This could be the largest and most ambitious search ever mounted for the Jersey Devil. All right, go ahead. Monster Quest is in the remote pine barrens of New Jersey searching for a mysterious flying creature. Nestled close to the population centers of Philadelphia and New York, the sparsely populated pine barrens have a notorious past. Its name comes from the acidic sandy soil and the pine trees that thrive here. This forest has been a refuge for poachers, moonshiners, and bandits. It is also rumored to be home to a much more sinister creature, a monster locals have named the Jersey Devil. Professor Angus Gillespie teaches American history at Rutgers University and is an expert on Jersey Devil lore. He recounts the earliest and most famous legend of the beast, a tale that dates back to 1735. Jane Leeds and her husband Daniel, uh, they lived uh, in a cabin along uh, the Mullica River in the Great Swamp. And uh, folks in those parts said um, it was a strange family, an unusual family. The Leeds had 12 children, which was extraordinary in the 1700s. We know that once uh, she became pregnant with her 13th child, as she was saying her bedtime prayers, she said, Lord, uh, let this one not be a child. Let this one be a devil. One frigid February night, the 13th Leeds child was born. started out, it was a perfectly healthy, normal little baby boy with blonde hair and blue eyes. But then something went terribly wrong. In place of the baby blue eyes, there were eyes all right, but they were glowing red like two burning coals. And they were set in the horrible head of a horse with two horns coming out on either side of, of the horse's head. And, and where the shoulder blade should have been, there were the wings of a bat. It had a, a long serpentine tail. The creature gave out a blood-curdling scream and escaped out the chimney. The legend says that the beast has terrified the region ever since. As fantastic as the story may sound, eyewitnesses continue to claim to see the beast to this day. 
many of the sightings of creature and capture its image on film. The team has created a 35-man line and are pushing wildlife towards 25 spotters in the trees ahead. We should see some of the drivers coming across here now. There's another guy up ahead there. Ensuring the line stays in formation without any gaps requires constant direction. Hey, Corey, go across that road! Don't stop! Suddenly, something is spooked. Here it comes, here it comes. Tom, get to the left here. Come here, we've got this clearing here. Maybe you get a shot at it. There it goes. Look like a fawn or a doe. Do you see any antlers yeah. on it? What mean? Look like a doe. Typical pine barren deer. Right. Small. <laughs> All right, move it out, Corey! The deer sighting hints that more animals are in the area. Fans' team is on heightened alert. John, you see anything? Yeah, I see three to the right. Yeah, right after you guys started to drive, I saw three deer. They came out of the woods right here. They came like right under me and they went out that way. It looked like a uh, doe and two fawns. Then, another sighting. Roger, so you heard something, but you didn't see anything. Yeah, that's a rock. Can you describe the sound that you heard, Ed? Something crashing up in the trees. Yeah, like something, something loud, but like I said, I turned the camera when I get to look at it. Retired NYPD detective Mitch Parker has traveled to the Winkleman home to search for new evidence and to test the reliability of their eyewitness story. I'll look at the, uh, the location where the people said they saw the creature, maybe take some measurements, maybe take some photographs. And then what I'd really like to do is polygraph the people that are saying they're seeing these things. Joining Parker for this portion of the investigation is Frank Cacamo, also a retired detective from the NYPD. Seemingly insignificant details can crack a case, so the detectives note even the minor aspects of the scene. Where were you uh, and your son standing when you disconnected the electric? Um, right here at this pole. With your finger, why don't you show us the height that he might have seen the uh, thing at? And so it was like at the top perch? Right. They measure the distance to determine if an animal could have leapt the span. What do you got, Frank? Yeah, Mitch, that's going to be 43.8. Next, they inspect the roof for clues. Does it look like there's any scratches at any roofing tiles? Not from here, no, but I'm going to take some photos. Parker has asked the bird expert to help him examine the claim that the beast flew overhead. Troy Edel is the Director of Conservation at the New Jersey Audubon Society. He is an expert on the area's indigenous wildlife. So using the process of elimination, what are some of the things you could rule out? I think we've got two key pieces of information here. One of them is there was obviously an, a lot of activity going on at night. So which animals are nocturnal and which of those are diurnal coming out in the daytime. So that narrows it down really quickly. What are some of the nocturnal feeders that are in this area? but definitely owls almost exclusively come out at night. Um, things like white-tailed deer, are they'll come out in, at near dusk, but they're also very active at night. Uh, foxes, potentially there could be bobcats, at least in the near area. The raccoons actually are another one that would come out during night here. These are very small trees, so it, it would be impossible for a creature as large as what they described to actually climb up and its weight be supported by one of those trees, much less the, uh, the pressure of it actually pouncing from a branch onto the roof. Going down the list of things, potential things that this could be, um, certainly there are several species of owls in this area. The great horned owl is very common in this area. It's the largest owl in the United States. Great horned owls have been known to attack humans. It's the only one that has visible ear tufts, so look like horns. Um, it has a very large face, so we have a big forehead, big facial disc. Um, has it, its eyes will shine red in the light. The owls fly through the air silently. Great horned owls can have a wingspan of up to five feet and are active in the winter months when many Jersey Devil sightings have been reported. If you ever have seen owls in zoos and if you get too close to their cages, that's one of their immediate defense postures. They will back into the corner and they will snap their beaks. Snap, 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 snap. It's a sound similar to what Lori Winkleman heard, 
but she says it was no owl that attacked them. It was something very large. I would say that it was larger than a human, so over six feet. The identity of the creature may lie in the analysis of this photograph that the Winkelmans took of a track left behind by the predator. First thing is that these tracks are in snow, and one thing that's known, well known about any sort of animal tracks in the snow is that they are very rapidly distorted. They can appear much larger than they are. They can appear to be something completely different than what actually made them. Secondly, when you look at these pictures, the angle's just not ideal what you would want, if, let's say if you were doing a forensic investigation. What we lack is a very clear, distinct photograph, close-up, from above. So we could look down into the tracks and see things such as, uh, are there nail prints? Uh, how many toes does, does the animal show in the snow, if any? In this picture, clearly there's an animal is either hopping or uh, that the animal is taking each step with both feet together. Uh, the police report reports the tracks as six inches long. The six inch track would be pretty large, but we have to remember the possibility for distortion. And um, the four foot span between each individual track, you know, that again gets back to, it sounds like it's something that was hopping down that roof. Etel discusses what the most likely candidates could be. And birds in snow in particular will do that hop since they're not as, as uh, effective or efficient walkers as a lot of other animals are. But you can begin to rule out those things that it's definitely not, but it would be difficult to impossible to say exactly what they are. The track analysis of the Winkleman photo did not determine the identity of the animal. But could another, even more recent photograph shed light on the mystery of the Jersey Devil? Monster Quest is searching for a mysterious beast known as the Jersey Devil. It is said to prowl the northeastern United States. Descriptions vary, but all tell of a terrifying monster. In 1909, one of the biggest events in Jersey Devil history took place, and it's known as Phenomenal Week. In just eight days, hundreds of people saw the creature. They weren't just one person seeing it, too. As some of the events that were taking place were entire trolley cars full of people. Literally, the Jersey Devil was just seen all over the place, throughout New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York. The whole area was rampant with Jersey Devil sightings. The Philadelphia Zoo posted a $1 million reward for the creature's capture. There was a telegraph worker who claimed to have shot the creature but he could not provide a body. You had um, government officials, town officials, and considered to be honest, truthful people were seeing this, this creature at the same time. And the week sent everyone in the area into a complete panic. Um, schools were shutting down early, uh, businesses were closing, people were keeping their children inside, no one was going out after dark. The whole area was just in a state of emergency condition. Never before had the creature been seen by so many, but the descriptions varied wildly. Jabberwocky, kangaroo horse, cowbird, prehistoric lizard, or wingless and shaped like a dog. The descriptions weren't unlike the creature in this photograph, a creature some think could be a Jersey Devil. My theory is that the surf had washed the body up and it, was, it wasn't there any longer than three, four hours. Christina Pampalone took this grisly photograph on July 12, 2008. That day I was on the beach with my boyfriend Ryan. We walked about 200 yards and I saw this thing and it was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. I grabbed his camera and uh, took those photos of it. The creature was discovered in New York 175 miles northeast of the Jersey Pine Barrens. It was dubbed the Montauk Monster after the beach where it was found. Initially, I didn't think that the pictures um, 
would be worth anything to anybody. So I just kind of kept them to show my family and friends. And then about two weeks later, the photo showed up all over Long Island newspapers from another girl that had taken a picture that day. And that's when I approached Ryan and I said, Ryan, we have better pictures of this creature. We have different angles. Um, it dispels certain theories that people had as to what they thought it was. My photos show flies on it. It shows um, the size of its teeth. It shows that it has rodent-like characteristics, but also dog-like, canine-like characteristics. The photograph ignited a flurry of interest and controversy after it spread across the media. I really don't know what it is. I thought it was a rodent, but from looking at the size of its teeth, uh, I don't know. Speculation about the Montauk monster took on a life of its own. The most intriguing theory was that the creature was the product of a man-made experiment. I really don't know where it came from. Uh, some people think Plum Island. I don't know. Just 18 miles from where Pampalone took a photograph is Plum Island Animal Disease Center, a mysterious government lab dubbed by some Monster Island. It was decommissioned as a military base in 1954 and taken over by the Department of Agriculture. The government used it to study livestock diseases such as foot and mouth in a controlled setting. It now operates under the Department of Homeland Security. During the Cold War, a rumor emerged that the facility was being used to create biological weapons to battle the Soviet Union. Television cameras are forbidden on the island but Monster Quest was granted special access to film in this secure facility. Dr. Larry Barrett is a veterinarian and director of the Plum Island Center. He has worked on the uninhabited island since 2006 and explains the history of the facility. They construct the Plum Island Animal Disease Center here. It opened in 1956, and its function was basically to protect the animal's livestock, and the first thing that they started working on was basically foot and mouth disease. Plum Island is three miles long by one mile wide. While the island is home to seals and birds, all the facility's domestic livestock are kept inside the confines of the lab. The Department of Agriculture denies that any military work has been done on the island since they assumed control in the 50s. None of the work that the Army was doing was transferred. There was no work on biological agents that was picked up from the Army. Two separate workloads. None of the work that we do here is classified. None of the work that we do here is secret. Uh, we do have concerns about an agent escaping off this island and getting back to the mainland, but we have different layers of security to prevent that. But the problem was, because of the tight security that was around it, a lot of myths came up in the community. And so today what we have is in you know, a community that in many cases is concerned about what we actually do here. The discovery of the Montauk monster caused the Plum Island Animal Disease Center to comment on a possible link to their facility. And I can understand where people were, were confused about what it is. This is the only picture at that time that I had available to review. When you look at the animal, it looks like either a raccoon, uh, a dog, or some other, a cat, some animal that was skinned, and basically it, it almost looked like a beak on the animal. But Pompalone's photo helps Barrett explain what the creature might be. In this picture, you can definitely see that this is a dog. Here's, in, and it, it appears to be a boxer, because it, the jaw teeth, the, basically the lower jaw protrudes out. And if you look at a picture of a boxer here on its skull, you can see that the jaw teeth definitely protrude out over the upper canine teeth. If we go back to our picture here, you can see that these jaw teeth are ex extending out. The animal has lost its canine teeth, but you have a nasal septum. And basically, this was probably a bulldog that washed up on the shore, had drowned. It's decomposing. Dr. Barrett says their mission is to protect livestock from foreign animal diseases. And the beast wasn't from Plum Island. First of all, we don't work on dogs, we don't work on pets, we only work on livestock. So the diseases that we work with are diseases that affect cattle, affect pigs, affect sheep, goats, horses. It would seem that the Jersey Devil and the Montauk Monster are not one and the same. But eyewitnesses across New Jersey are convinced the monsters they're seeing are real. It wasn't a bird, it, it wasn't a cougar, it wasn't a bear. Um, it was just something really horrible and really indescribable. Mitch Parker is working with eyewitnesses to create a composite image of the Jersey Devil, which will then be used to create a three-dimensional sculpture of the creature. 
Parker re-interviews Laurie Winkleman, allowing him to test the consistency of her account. What size was the head? The head was like... What size was the head? The head was like larger on the top. The head was like way too large on the top. They were like big, elongated eyes to me. Like I didn't see a mouth, but I saw this icky, ridged nose thing. As he interviews the witnesses, the creature takes shape. What about the shape of the eyes? Were they almond? Were they round? Big and round, very round, yeah. The neck was, it was long, it was, it was dark, just like its face. Once the sketches are complete, sculptor Mike Melillo steps in to create a 3D representation of the creature. I'm trying to put myself into the minds of the Winkleman family. Murillo has created special effects and design props for many years. We're going to use expanding polyurethane foam to make a lightweight substructure. We're going to use an old-fashioned technique that goes back to the early 1930s. Parker then takes his interviews in another direction. A polygraph examination is 97% uh, accurate. Dennis DiBernardis is a former NYPD polygraph expert. He will now administer a polygraph test to Lori Winkleman and her son Glenn. What happened in the backyard that night? What was it credible? Uh, were these people seeing things that wasn't there? I was brought into this investigation here by uh, Detective Mitch uh, Parker to determine the truthfulness of uh, the two witnesses. Is your first name Lori? Yes. Do you believe you saw something out of the ordinary on that evening? Yes. When you saw that creature, were you in fear of your son's life? Yes. In the remote pine barrens of New Jersey, a monster quest search is underway for a creature that haunts the area, a monster that locals call the Jersey Devil. The descriptions of the creature first seen in the 1800s bear a frightening resemblance to a known animal. There are similarities between the reported sightings of the Jersey Devil and the hammerhead bat from Africa. Joe D'Angeli is a bat biologist from New Jersey. He has studied these animals for 20 years and operates a nocturnal animal exhibit. It's a very large bat, being the largest bat in Africa, and actually uh, its Latin name, Monstrosus, probably gives you an idea of that the animal looks monstrous. The African hammer-headed bat can have a wingspan of up to three feet and an average lifespan of 30 years. It is even known to attack chickens. It is possible that this bat species may have made its way over to North America um, from a shipment, from liberation from a zoo, or maybe even the pet trade. Slavery was legal in New Jersey until 1846, and shipments of slaves from Africa were regularly transported to the state. Could a hammer-headed bat have also made the journey? It is possible that this bat species could have made it here by being smuggled on a ship. The long journey would have had to have a lot of fruit for this animal to survive. But experts say the bat wouldn't have much chance to survive in a frigid winter climate. This bat species is used to, you know, a climate of 80 to 90 degrees every day, uh, a large amount of fruits year-round, and a very, very tropical high humidity. So even if it did make it here to New Jersey, the chances of survival are, are slim, especially in the wintertime. And eyewitness Fran Coppola confirms that what she saw back in 1997 was not a bat. So every time I think about it, I kind of get shivers. Fran Coppola owns a colonial village frequented by tourists on the southeastern edge of the Pine Barrens. It was cold. It was starting to get dark because we didn't get back until about 5 o'clock. I went back into the trash area. When you walk in and the door closes, you kind of feel like you're in an area right, like not protected so much because there's only one way out and that's the way that you come in. 
I felt a presence behind me and I turned around and up against the wall was a huge um, uh, shadow of, uh, was like a wing. My first reaction was, oh my God, I, it was very scary. I quickly turned around and thought, oh my gosh, I, I need to get out of here. This is, I was all by myself here. There was nobody here. The village was totally closed down and I was all by myself. So I like quickly left there and I went out and I got into the street. Thirty miles from Smithville, the Monster Quest search team is looking to capture evidence of the Jersey Devil. How you guys doing in there? Doing good. You getting wet? Oh yeah, I'm drenched already. The search party is midway through the drive. Fans' line of men are a half mile from the search perimeter, driving the wildlife towards 25 men who watch for any signs of animal movement. Yeah, there's a report of more animals in the middle of the drive. Yes. Hey, Chuck, is that you on there? Yes, sir, coming out to the head stand. Did you see it? You know, did you identify the animal? Yes, it was a white-tailed variety. Ah, white-tailed deer, okay. So there's still animals ahead. The search has already yielded four sightings, so fans is optimistic. The drivers are telling me it's getting really thick in here, so if we're oh, going to okay. see anything, it might be a good place. And the standers are not that far from us, so we might have another 10 minutes to go. Okay. So a lot of times the animals will concentrate at the end of the drive. Mm -hmm. So now's the time when we would really expect to see something. As the drive continues, the creatures of the forest take flight. Fans and his team document the action. Just flew out of the tree. What's that, Chuck? Something just flew out of the tree ahead of us. Hey, Chuck, any idea what it was? Did you see what that was that flew out of the tree? It was out in front of us. We didn't get a good look. 10-4. Move it out, Chuck. We're going again. Take it out! Move it out! Fans puts out a call. Hey, Ed, and uh, ask the guys that were standers um, if they if they saw anything, if they heard anything. And then, because uh, what we'd like to do is we want to uh, kind of question everyone to see what they may have seen on that drive, okay? All right, we have two sightings so far. I'm not to the end yet. Roger. The search is nearly complete, and the team is making their way to the rendezvous point to review their footage. I've been doing polygraph tests. I'm a certified polygraph examiner since 1980, and I've performed thousands of polygraph examinations. Dennis DiBernardis was enlisted by Mitch Parker to determine the truthfulness of the eyewitness accounts of the sightings. The procedure when you initiate a lie detector test uh, is first you get the findings of what happened that night. Of course, I wasn't there. So I look at the police report. I look at... Uh, the investigator on this case, which is the detective Mitch Parker, I look at his results. I interview and interrogate the two witnesses involved. What we do is we place a, a tube for breathing, a blood pressure cup to monitor uh, the heart rate, and also on the fingers there's what they call uh, the galvanic skin response. That monitors the electronic changes that take place in your body. Did you recognize what type of animal this was? No. After the polygraph tests are performed, we numerically evaluate the charts. The conclusion in this case was that they were very truthful, both of them. This proves that the Winkelmans believe they saw something strange in their backyard that night. Yet it's not proof of what they saw. If this was a, a, a trial or, or uh, going to court, if it was a crime, and they, were, they would make very good witnesses, I believe both of them, something unusual occurred in the back of her house that night, uh, a sighting of an unusual creature that basically scared the daylights out of her and put her in fear of her life and her son's life at the time. Detective Parker will now test whether the sculpture that Mike and Lillo created is what the Winkelmans believe they saw. No one knows what this thing really is. No one knows what it looks like or what its musculature or its frame actually are. So to create something from what is basically eyewitness testimony is very difficult. A 
positive identification would mean that for the first time, we may see the face of the Jersey Devil. Monster Quest is searching for an elusive creature that has terrorized New Jersey for over 250 years. Some believe it is a supernatural demon. Others say it is simply a misidentified bird. And still more believe it is a natural creature that has yet to be discovered. This woman and her son were terrorized by a flying creature and discovered these mysterious prints. This man has applied 20 years of NYPD detective experience to solve the mystery. This biologist believes the creature may be a misidentified great horned owl. But this researcher has documented over 325 eyewitness encounters with an unknown animal. And this man has mounted what might be the largest ever search for the legendary creature. You see anything there over here on the other side of the drive, Ed? Pull your guys out and then we'll meet, we'll meet you at the vans. Tracker Dave fans have seen many animals during his 60-man search for the creature. But so far, nothing they could identify as a Jersey Devil. The Monster Quest team's search is over. They leave their positions to rendezvous at a rallying point and debrief. Gather around! Fans questions the men to ascertain what they saw. Anybody else see anything over there that you know of? No. No? No. I'm trying to figure out if I got it on my camera or not. Did you get it? Uh, no, there's a big blur. No, What'd you say? A bird of some kind. Yeah? Off camera. Just a bird. Yeah. Was it a big bird? Yeah, it was pretty big. So, sounds like a lot of deer and a lot of small birds. With all the sightings reported, the team loads up for the drive back to base camp. Mike Melillo has completed his sculpture of the Jersey Devil based on the eyewitness descriptions. Now, Lori Winkleman and her son Glenn will come face to face with the monster. Oh, wow. It's, that's insane. It's exactly what I saw. The same forehead, the same eye, the same... It's everything. It's pretty accurate. It's really, really scary. That is like so horrible. That's totally, totally horribly it. Ugh. It's really, really close. It is, it really is. And just the horrible eyes, just the horrible, and the forehead, like nailed it, absolutely nailed it. It definitely gets the same reaction from me that uh, uh, it did that night. Marillo's sculpture offers the first glimpse of the face of the Jersey Devil. The Winkleman's reaction impresses the detective. The witnesses passed the lie detector test with flying colors. That brings up their credibility. I knew they were telling the truth beforehand, but now that they passed, I believe them even more. They, I don't know if they saw a Jersey Devil, but they saw something out there. Biologist Troy Ettel acknowledges the eyewitness sightings but suggests an alternative theory to explain what they are seeing. You put people who aren't really familiar with the natural world, with the ecology of the outdoors, and you put them into a situation where they begin encountering these native wild animals. Um, if they don't know what they are, their mind is going to jump to trying to explain it in any way that they possibly can. And I think sometimes that explanation is that they've seen a monster. This Monster Quest expedition has revealed some startling facts. The eyewitnesses who report seeing the creature are telling the truth about what they saw. And according to Dr. Barrett, the Montauk monster is not a devil, but is likely a decomposed boxer dog. Finally, Dr. Troy Ettel believes a great horned owl may be responsible for many of the Jersey Devil sightings. The wings of a bat, the head of a horse, the, the feet of a goat the serpentine tail. Well, none of that is, is owl-like. So I think like the best I could say for the owl is it's just it's confusion. Uh, people are confusing the owl with, with, with the monster, with the creature. Because okay. we're really talking about a, a, a monster here. Whatever it was, was repulsive, and I didn't want to look at it. I think it's definitely possible that something could be out there 
that could remain hidden for a significant period of time.